Today I'm going to be talking about the Audio Engine A2 Plus, which retail for about $269 per pair. These speakers were loaned to me direct from Audio Engine. I was not told to review them in any certain way. I was just sent the speakers and here we are. So what I'm going to do today is I'm so it's not like I said what I'm going to do. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to break down some of the uh subjective thoughts that I have while listening to these speakers, try to give you a, a good idea of how to use them, give you some objective data to back up what I heard and why I heard what I heard, and maybe even explain why sometimes the data might not make sense with what you're going to hear. But before I go any further, I want to say thank you to Crutchville for sponsoring today's video. That's how I'm bringing this to you ad-free unless YouTube just runs its ads anyway, should be ad-free all the way through. And with that said, let's talk about Crutchville for a second. Today's video is sponsored by Crutchville. They wanted me to let you all know that they're having a major sale July 16th through 17th, right in competition with Amazon Prime. But I'm about to tell you why you should go to Crutchville and not bother with Amazon this year. Let me tell you a little story. It was around 2003 and 50 cents in the club just dropped. You know that one. Though. Go shawty, it's your birthday. We're gonna, that song had just came out. Now, I had just taken my 2000 Ford Explorer four-door, and I had put a new Sony Explode head unit in. Despite the name Explode, I wasn't getting any explosive bass, so it was time to add subwoofers. Crutchfield, who I'd known and been familiar with for a long time, was running a sale. It came with a Rockford Fosgate Punch 401S amplifier and two 10-inch subwoofers in a sealed enclosure. Man, I spent an entire night in my friend's garage, three of us, hooking that thing up. And how many fuses did we blow? Probably two or three. I got that thing up and running around three or four o'clock in the morning, and the three of us jumped in that Explorer, and we just went driving around, blasting music. We were loving it. We were just having so much fun, and it was one of the greatest times in my life now looking back. And honestly, that was kind of the introduction to my audio habit. Crutchfield makes all this stuff, not just in terms of price available to us, but it makes it easy to do with their flyers, with their information, with their customer service. If you ever have any questions, you can just call them up and ask them, hey, how do I do this? And that has kept me as a return customer. And that is what causes me to continue to recommend Crutchfield to all of my friends when they're shopping for any gear from home amplifiers, to car amplifiers, to stereos, to outdoor speakers, and televisions. If you need it, Crutchville's got it, and their support is nice. As you can see, the speakers that I was sent are the color blue, which honestly, I think look fantastic. And when you see them next to this old eight track player that I purchased, it's even cooler. These are powered speakers. They do have Bluetooth 5.0, a micro USB input, two AB analog 15 watt amplifiers, each speaker features a three quarter inch silk dome tweeter and a single two and three quarter inch fiber woofer. There are standard RCA inputs and a three and a half millimeter input as well. You also have a volume knob on the back if you wanna play around with that to set everything just perfectly and then you can use your computer volume to go from there. And these things are small. That's actually one of the benefits of having this speaker. It's frequency responses all over the place. It takes some finagling to get to sound linear on your desk, but as far as something that doesn't take up a lot of room and looks nice and sounds at least decent for a reasonable price, these are gonna do the trick for you. Besides the blue, which you see here, they also come in black, white, and red. I chose the blue because blue's my favorite color. Let's talk about some pros real fast, and honestly, this is gonna be kind of short. The thing about these speakers are they're small. That's the pro. These feature a two and three quarter inch mid bass driver. They're not gonna get that low. They're designed to sit on the desk. Do not put them on stands at ear level. If you do, you're gonna capture all of that nonlinear sound. It's gonna sound very colored. If you set them on a desk, you're gonna get the best out of them. What's gonna happen is there's a strong mid range droop, not as strong as the FIO SP3, which I'm gonna talk about in a little bit, but as a strong mid range droop, because of that, when you set it on the desk, it's gonna fill in by about one to two decibels. That's typically what I found is the case from desk bounce. You're also gonna be sitting above that tweeter line. And I recommend doing so where you can be positioned about 20 degrees or so above that tweeter line. You're not gonna be listening far away. If you're listening more than an arm's length away, 
they're not going to get that loud for you. So that's going to be a problem. I also do recommend you tow them out. Don't face them directly at you, but maybe point them out away from you. So where they're facing about 20 degrees away from your ears. Doing that, which are all typical use scenarios for desktop speakers, will give you a more neutral sound than what you're going to see in the data. I also like all the features of the inputs. The only thing that these don't have is an HDMI input. And I know some of you are probably rolling your eyes so heavily that your head's gonna fall off your shoulders. Cool. The only reason I say that is because some other people will say they don't have an HDMI input. I'm with you folks who are thinking, who cares? They're computer speakers. But I'm just saying that now to catch the people who are gonna say they don't have HDMI input. Yes, we know. They don't need to. They're computer speakers. Getting to the cons, which I've kind of already tapped into. It's a very nonlinear anechoic response, but once you set them on the desk in typical listening situations, it'll smooth right out. That mid-range will smooth in some. The high frequency won't be as high compared to that mid-range anymore. The bass still though, I mean, it would be cool if it got lower. Yeah, it would be cool. It only gets down to around 100 hertz with any sort of authority. Below that, they, they just fall off. But for their size, that's okay. Remember, these are really small, little compact computer desk speakers. In my listening, basically, to be honest with you all, it was YouTube music or Apple music. I had these speakers set up down below me, maybe like arm's length away, roughly, sitting on top of my desk. This is a sit-stand desk, by the way, which I love this thing. Definitely helps with my lower back issues. When I'm listening to YouTube, when I'm listening to Apple music, I'm, I'm working, right? Like I'm working at my computer. I'm not sitting there going, Oh, give me all the sound quality and the chocolatey bottom end bass. I don't do that. So when I'm listening to these speakers, nothing stood out to me as a significant issue in that listening session. However, if I were to take these and put these on a stand and raise them up off that desk, that became a problem. Now, how do I know that? Because I have stands that I keep my Cali LP UNF monitors on top of. And so I set them up on there and all of a sudden that mid-range droop became more apparent set them back down on top of the desk, that mid-range droop filled in and the high frequency wasn't as bright and wasn't nearly as bright because they were lower relative to my ear. So for the most part in typical use situations, you're gonna find that you have at least a mostly mild sounding speaker. It's not gonna be hi-fi enthusiast type level speakers, but they're gonna sound just fine. And my favorite part is that they're small. Matter of fact, I bought this eight track player for a friend and then I put these speakers with them and I gave them to her. So heads up guys at Audio Engine, I'm gonna ask if I can buy these cause I've already given them to her. Like, okay, you know, okay. There's 270 bucks that you didn't count for having. I guess I'm gonna buy these speakers from you. So let's talk about the data and I'm gonna zip through this pretty quickly. All the data was captured using my Clip on Near Field Scanner. It is a state-of-the-art robotic device that allows me to get anechoic data in a non-anechoic environment. For those who don't know, anechoic means without echo, no echo. And the reason that you want to have this kind of data is because you want to know what the speaker is doing. And even though it may sound contrary to what I've been talking about, about how these anechoic measurements don't necessarily line up with what you hear when you put the speaker on the desk, that's not entirely true because we can predict what the sound is going to do when you put a speaker into a certain place, as long as you have the speaker's raw response without any influence of the room. So as I said earlier, I know from experience and from measuring tons of speakers that when you set them on top of a desk, what typically happens is around 100 hertz to about one kilohertz, depending on the speaker design, but usually this is the case, will fill in. And it roughly fills in by about two, maybe three decibels. It'll bring that mid-range up. So what you'll find a lot of the times is that many small desktop speakers, if they're designed well, and if they're designed to be listened to sitting on top of a desk, they'll have a little bit of a mid-range scoop. Not a seven decibel mid-range scoop, because that would be insane, but a little bit of a mid-range scoop. The high frequencies also will look extended or boosted because the designers, they know that you're gonna set the speakers down below you. So that's another thing to factor in when you're looking at the on-axis frequency response of an anechoic measurement. These really are simple things to deduce from raw anechoic measurements. But without me saying that up front, I know some people are going to see the measurement and go, oh my gosh, it's the worst thing ever. Now, having said that, there are speakers that are designed like the Cali LP UNF that I use, where they are designed to be used on a desk or on a stand, but they have dip switches on the back so you can make those adjustments on the fly. This is the frequency response on axis. So here's your mid-range dip right here. I kind of expect to see that. It's a swing of about 
plus or minus three decibels, so about six decibels. In my opinion, too much. What I would have liked to seen Audio Engine do, and maybe they're gonna take this advice, I have no idea, is to take some DSP, bring this little bump around 200 hertz down, because in my opinion, that 200 hertz bump doesn't do anything to give you any weighty impact. When you're down with an F3 at 100 hertz, I mean, that there's just not a lot of bass output. Now going up to the high end, you can see that it's actually relatively linear. Uh, it's about maybe negative two decibels compared to the on axis from about 3K to about 5K. Yeah, I wish that weren't there. Desk bounce doesn't solve that. So that really should be taken out. Could be a crossover integration issue. I'm not really sure. But in my opinion, the things that could be done is fix this dip. Don't let this come down as far. They've got DSP, I'm sure, inside of these speakers. So bring this up, flatten that out by about one decibel, CEA 2034 data set. Estimated in-room response is really only good if you're listening at far away distances where reflections matter. In this case, you're gonna be listening so close to the speaker that sidewall reflections and things like that aren't gonna factor in. But here you go for those of you who wanna see it, assuming that you're gonna be listening far enough away for reflections to matter. Horizontal contour is about plus or minus 60 degrees. Vertical radiation, you can sit above about 30 degrees of the tweeter, or you can sit negative 15 degrees of the tweeter. But personally, I would say 20 degrees above that tweeter line is gonna be that sweet spot unless you go in and use equalization, which I do have some equalization tips for you in a little bit. Distortion at 86 decibels, distortion at 96 decibels. That bass is ramping up. And actually 96 decibels for this speaker is really pushing the compression or the limiter. And you'll see what I mean in a second. Multi-tone distortion pretty high, but again, really small speaker. So it's not like I can complain too much. What I found to be the case was actually based on the compression measurements. This 0.22 volt input, which equates to about 87 decibels at one meter or so, is really the part where compression really starts to set in. So let's look at that. Compression, 86 decibels in red, 96 decibels in blue, but somewhere in between here is where the compression or the limiter starts to kick in and really limit that bass output. So you're definitely not getting a linear sound anymore. If you're listening to these speakers at that high of an output level as computer desk speakers in the near field, you're listening to the wrong speaker. You need to be paying for something larger that has more bass and less limiting. And just for those of you who are interested in what I would recommend for EQ, this is what I came up with with REW. Now I'm not EQing below 200 Hertz in this case. I'm basically EQing up that mid-range dip and I'm flattening out the treble up here down to here. This would be assuming that you're trying to get a linear speaker and then maybe you might start undoing some of the EQ effects once you set it down on your desk. If you're searching for a flat anechoic on axis response. But again, remember, you're gonna put it on a desk, so things are gonna change. Keep that in mind. Now let's do a comparison. What I'm gonna compare this to is the Cali LP UNF, which run about $299 per pair, as well as the FIO SP3, which also run about $299 per pair. First, let's look at a size reference. The audio engine is in red, the FIO is in green, and the Cali is in blue. Now you can tell from looking at this that the Cali is quite a bit bigger. And like I said, in terms of volume, it's roughly two times the size of the audio engine. The audio engine and the FIO are pretty much neck and neck in terms of size. So if you wanna compare something in terms of size, look at the FIO. If you wanna compare it in terms of just price and overall fidelity, but never minding the size, then you can look at the LPUNF. The Cali LPUNF is much more linear, but again, it's a lot larger. And it also gets a lot lower, but again, it's a lot larger. The Cali UP LP UNF also comes with a lot of dip switches. So if you wanna set them up high on stand, you can. Or if you wanna set them on your desk, you can. If you wanna bring them off the wall or put them near the wall, you can do those things. Flip a little dip switch on the back. For 299, it's a great value speaker. But again, it's about twice the size of the audio engine. Comparing this to the FIO, which is closer in size, practically the same size, I would recommend the audio engine. So the FIO is much more nonlinear and you can fix some of those things with some equalization and even placement can help some of those things. But my biggest issue with the FIO is that the high frequency is way too boosted compared to the mid range. And there's a very strong resonant peak around 70 Hertz. I mean, it's super narrow and it's super boomy and bloomy, and I just did not like that speaker at all. I think that with equalization, it can certainly be made to sound better, but if I'm choosing between the two, I'm gonna save 30 bucks and I'm gonna go with the audio engine. And if you're curious what the on-axis frequency response looks like between these three, 
Let's start with the audio engine. So here you go on Axis. You've already seen this. And now I'm going to bring in the FIOS. Okay. Now it's hard to level match speakers when they are this different in frequency response. So trust me, I tried to level match them. I basically just said, all right, let's level match between 400 to about 600 Hertz. I try to get like right in the meat of that mid range. So you can see what I'm talking about with that peak of the file at 70 Hertz is right here. It's very hard to EQ something like that out. Then the file just starts going up in tweeter level overall. That's kind of why I'm leaning more toward the audio engine. Now, if you bring in the Kali in blue, you can see that the Kali is more linear overall. So I'm gonna get rid of the file for a second. Yeah, see how much more linear the Kali is? You're paying $30 more, but you're also paying for a lot larger speaker with the Kali. If you need a small speaker and you just want some good background noise, then the audio engine will check those boxes but just don't expect uber high fidelity. So that does it for my review. Again, these are all my opinions backed up, hopefully with some data that makes sense to you. If you disagree, that's fine, man. Let me know in the comment section below. And if you have any questions or comments otherwise, you can also ask those questions in the comment section below. Remember, Crutchfield's got this really cool sale coming up. If you're interested, use my affiliate link, jump on over there and buy whatever you want. That helps this channel out a lot and I 100% appreciate it. It allows me to keep doing what I'm doing. I will talk to y'all later. Take care. Peace.